And here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Michael Grudadoria, and uh, I am a, a functional chiropractic neurologist and uh, functional medicine doc. I am Heather. Um, I'm a parent of a 19 year old son who was struggling with anxiety and depression. And my name is Rob Colvin. I am a psychologist and an attorney. And I'm just so happy that we pulled this all together because we really wanted to kind of have a conversation, just a fluid conversation about what's going on out there with young people these days. Try to bring some information to people that, you know, may be struggling with, uh, you know, children or, you know, young adults that have these kinds of issues. And, you know, there just seems to be, it's so common. And I think that people are really trying to figure out what the right move is, you know, what do I do? Where do I go? Who do I call? And I think the frustration level has been very, very high. So I think with that, maybe Heather, you can talk a little bit. Sure. Um, I'll start off by telling you my story with my son. Um, my son is currently 19. He's, he's doing incredible. He's going off to college, leaving the nest, doing what a typical 19 year old should be doing. However, if you asked me a year ago, if I thought that we would be doing exactly this, I would tell you absolutely not. So I'll give you a little background on him. Um, he's a great kid. He was always quiet, never got in trouble at school, got good grades. He didn't have a whole lot of friends in his social circle, but the few that he had, they were good friends. So to me as a mom, everything was fine until one day it just wasn't. Um, he came home from school one day from high school and he just fell apart. He was crying um, he just told me he couldn't do it anymore. And I honestly had no idea what he was even talking about. Um, we always had such a great relationship. He's very open with me. Um, so it kind of took my breath away when he was having this conversation with me because I had no idea how hard his life was and how much he was struggling. Um, so that quiet boy, that I knew was filled with so much anxiety and depression. And I just, I just really had no idea. I never, I never saw it. Um, so I did a lot of research. I'm an overthinker. So I spent endless, endless hours reading blogs, joining Facebook groups, uh, seeking out therapists, joining social groups. I was trying to do anything I could to make things better. Um, we started doing pep talks in the morning before he went to school. I would send him text messages. I was trying to kind of get in his mind space because I'm a positive person and he wasn't. And these things that we were doing were working for a little bit. And then they, they really just weren't. Like I realized I was in way over my head. I couldn't get him better. So we went down the therapist route. And that, that's a hard one because you have to find somebody who clicks with your personality. Um, and that wasn't working, but a therapist recommended a neurologist and we went and they suggested medication. And I have to tell you, it scared me. They prescribed it within the first 10 minutes that we were there and medicate, you know, medication works, it does. But what I was thinking was, okay, at that time he was 17, I'm gonna put him on medication, but what's the end game? What happens when we have to stop? It just, it scared me. It scared me a lot. Um, so back to research, I went. Um, what, what medication did they put them on? Uh, Lexapro. Um, they also, you know, suggested Zoloft. Um, so I just didn't, I didn't know, like, what happens at the end? Do we do this the rest of his life? I mean, at some point he has to stop, then what? Um, so... I, I just need, I needed something else. I knew there was something else. And that's when I found Dr. Mike, a friend suggested a functional medicine doctor, um, kind of somebody who looks at the whole picture. They explained they cure from the inside out, but I never, ever, ever heard of this. And I have to tell you, my mind was blown after I did a lot more research. Um, and I'll never forget Dr. Mike when my son met with you for the very first time. And I've told the story before. And I'll try to keep it together because this is hard. Um, the car ride home, he looked at me and he said, mom, I finally feel like there's hope. 
And to me, that was everything. It was everything. Um, he was struggling for such a long time. And for him to have that glimmer of hope was, it, it just, it changed everything. Um, but in the end, I had no idea. And like I said, I'm an over-researcher, I'm an overthinker. I do everything to extreme. Um, I had no idea how closely food and anxiety and depression are related. It was like this hidden secret that, that we just found out about. And, you know, Dr. Mai got him on a regimen where supplements and vitamins that his body was lacking, a different diet. And here we are a year later, like I said, he's going off to college. He's, he's hanging out with friends. He's talking. He's a totally different person. I mean, it took a whole lot of work on his part, but I never, ever, ever thought from our first meeting till now, I would have my son back. It's just, it's an amazing thing to watch. And it's not over. It'll never be over. He'll always have to work at it, but it's just easier for him. Life is easier for him. So that's my story, but that's me, you know, as a parent, um, looking at from, I guess, the outside. But for you as doctors, like, what do you think? Like, why is this happening? How can we help? You know, I think, you know, Rob and I come from, you know, two different backgrounds and, and you know, we came together and we, we actually had these conversations. I mean, Rob, from your point of view as a psychologist, why are so many kids struggling today? I think it's more about our culture. Uh, a lot of things that, you know, there's so many factors that go into wellness and um, mental health issues that, you know, we look at just the symptom and we don't go any deeper. So, you know, uh, Heather, you really spoke to it when you said, talked about your son, about hope. When, you know, I met Dr. Mike, um, the first time I do did come from a different background, just psychology mindset. And psychologists are just learned uh, to treat uh, anxiety and depression with a certain mindset. The same way that neurologist you went to was uh, trained to look at things with a certain mindset. And I think that um, now I'm hopeful and I've learned that psychology has expanded to, you know, the mind-gut connection. And Dr. Mike, you know, working with Dr. Mike, I've seen personally what you talked about in terms of hope. And um, he's able to do that because he just doesn't want to fix the problem simply with medication. But it's about, you know, gaining insight and education as to why we're struggling. Because we all do struggle a little, right? So the better educated we are as a consumer about our own mental health, the better we are about treating it. And um, it's all about education. It's all about, you know, becoming um, the best advocate for yourself in terms of mental health, the same way you should physical health. You, you, the best educated uh, consumer is really the best customer in terms of mental health. The better you can care for yourself, because not only is it um, our responsibility to help you, but it's also like you said, it's a long road ahead. And wellness is an effort. And you have to be vigilant about taking care of you. And I think in our culture, we kind of have gotten away from that. And we have, obviously, there's a huge negative stigma attached to struggling with mental illness. But the reality is we all struggle. So as soon as we can step up and say, we're all, well, I have a hard time. And the sooner we can become more educated through people like Dr. Mike and um, hopefully myself, uh, the better off we are at treating ourselves and taking care of ourselves. I think one of the problems is also, you know, parenting. Um, we really don't know what's going on with our children because uh, what's happening in their rooms is not, they're not simply just going to sleep. Their self-concept is being attacked through social media. And we don't know, like we could think they're going to sleep and things are great, but we don't know the wars and battles they're fighting um, upstairs in their room and you know that's that's a difficult thing and and when kids are silent like that we think everything is fine until um you know they're willing to speak so i think that's that's a big reason dr mike why i think it's become more of a problem i could go on on this topic but that is one of the reasons why i know i know you're a big advocate of uh, resilience i mean what what is 
what is resilience? Because you you know you talk about that a lot, and I think that's such a an important thing where you um you you, you feel like we're not kids are not as strong or tough or thick skin, and I think that might be a real big issue as well. Well, I think like one of the when I was coming here this morning to speak with you guys, um, I was thinking you know we are born out of resiliency. Just think of it in terms of the odds of getting a, a woman pregnant are uh, not likely. When you think about it, we have to overcome incredible odds for um, fertilization to take place. So it's, it's, that is resiliency in and of itself. The nature of our conception is born out of resiliency, right? Because we overcome all these odds for uh, sperm to impregnate the egg. Uh, and out of that, you know, we overcome so many things that we develop and we, we, we come out of this, out of, out of birth being uh, resilient. But I think um, in terms of overcoming odds, it becomes, life becomes more and more stressful. And to me, resiliency is about being the best equipped possible to overcome stress, which is inevitable and be, uh, and be best to cope with it. And I think that our culture is not focused on prevention, which to me is building resiliency so that we're in the best possible shape to overcome whatever stressor that may be. And because of we're not well equipped, we're not prepared, we are very reactive as opposed to proactive. So we're not focused on our diet or things like that to, to be best equipped to deal with the eventual stressor. And the eventual stressor, if we're not well equipped, could be could that stressor could turn into a trauma, right? Which could definitely have some serious negative uh, effects. So the better equipped we are, that is the more resilient we are to deal with the, the inevitable stressor, um, the better off we have of learning, becoming better and growing from that stressor. But I think um, our culture as a whole thinks reactively. We wait for a crisis to occur and then we react as opposed to focusing on prevention so that we're in the best shape possible to deal with that inevitable stress. I think that, you know, it's, it's interesting that, you know, we don't, we're never taught how to feel good about ourselves, how to have self-confidence, you know, like the things that, that we are, that we need as emotional and mental tools, nobody really gives us. And as a parent, I mean, you know, there was no, there was no workbook for me as a parent to be able to teach this to my kids. So it gets passed down. And then if you come from a, a home that is very stressful, then even more stress is in your life as a kid. So, you know, like you say, you're internalizing a lot of these things and then all the social media pressures and, and you're not, you know, they're just not equipped to really deal with the stresses. You know, from my point of view, I look at the physical side because when we, you know, what frustrates me is that the brain and the mind are one. We can't separate those two things. And we know that the brain is impacted by what's going on in our body. We know that the gut brain connection is very real. We know that nutrient deficiencies, we know, um, you know, impact the brain. We know that certain diets and inflammation impact the brain. We know that epigenetics impact the brain. And yet, you know, we go to a, a psychologist or a, or a psychiatrist when we have anxiety and we go to a neurologist when we have a headache. The, the same brain dysfunction causes both problems, but they're looked at from two totally different perspectives. And I think that's a big part of the problem. Nobody's really looking at us as a whole to try to figure out if we can update how the brain works and, and maybe even calibrate the brain a little bit better. Maybe a lot of these symptoms will go away. And they do because anxiety and depression are really symptoms of an underlying problem that we're trying to figure out, both from an emotional and mental perspective, as well as a biochemical and neurological one. And I think that's the beauty of our relationship is that, you know, we look at it from both sides because if a child has a, an issue growing up, let's say they have, you know, chronic GI distress, let's say they were on 10 rounds of antibiotics in their life and they wipe out their normal gut bacteria. What grows back are unhealthy bacteria that then have a different influence on the brain. So now they're set up to have an increased level of stressor physically. And now they encounter emotional stresses 
you know, and, and peer pressure and, you know, all the different things that they, you know, normally kids go through and all of a sudden they collapse. So now they have an emotional issue because they don't feel good about themselves and they have a physical issue. You can't look at it from one perspective or the other. We really need to integrate that and work together on trying to help them understand their emotionality and work through those things, as well as fix the underlying physiological problems and neurological imbalances that they have so that they can heal. And I think it's so frustrating to think that, you know, we're still, you know, in 2021, so disparate in our way of looking at things. And nobody, nobody agrees that, you know, everybody thinks that their way is the best way. And, um, you know, instead of saying, you know, listen, I bring something to this table, you bring something to the table, we all do. And that, you know, our patients really need a little of all of us. And I think that's the big, the big message that we're trying to put out there with this page is that there's so many options and, you know, it's not just, you know, medication or, or therapy or, um, you know, or nothing. Yeah, I think, I think it really makes it, I think that, you know, we have to work together and not just be in our little silos of real neurology, psychology, um, and we have to be willing to let go of that, our ego and expand it to learn, to educate ourselves that, you know, no two anxieties are the same. And, you know, you need to, you, you should search for the why, um, because, and then from the why you develop an evidence-based treatment plan to treat the underlying, you know, condition and hopefully those symptoms will subside or at least, um, give the person better understanding and hope, like I just spoke to hope is so uh, important. And um, therapeutic alliance is something we as psychologists put great emphasis on. And that's about, you know, trusting your therapist and trusting your healthcare workers, because the research has shown that that's probably the most important thing in terms of the successful intervention, the relationship you build. And if you're just not really talking to that patient and not expressing like, you know, we're gonna to get to this, we're gonna we're gonna dig deep and just treat it simply with medication, that's not the answer because they feel helpless. They feel like they, they take no ownership of their mental wellness. They just say, well, I have to take the pill. But, you know, there's so much that goes into wellness that it, it's oversimplification just to assume that a pill in of itself is going to fix the problem. I also think that, you know, we want to be clear that we're not anti-medication um, because medication has, has its place. Um, you know, sometimes people are in crisis and medication can give them, you know, short-term relief um, because what we do is really a process and it's more of a longer-term strategy. And I think that, you know, in certain cases, it, it absolutely can play a very important role. Look, Dr. Mike, you've taught me um, we've learned together, I think, as well, that, you know, medication is the tool. And all of these things are, the better equipped we are, we not say that medic we shouldn't say that medication is not the answer, it will be a piece to it. But, you know, like you say, we have to attack it on all fronts. And the better we do that is through collaboration and education um, with all the professionals focusing on the patient to say, let's, let's, let's all get together and figure out how we're going to fix this. I think a big frustration is when you see somebody and they come in and they're taking four or five different medications and they still t feel terrible. You know, it's like, well, this is clearly not the answer. And then, you know, it's a matter of let's try to get you off some of these things and let's work with your psychiatrist and start kind of weaning you off. But in any event, I think that our goal for this Facebook group is to, to kind of offer hope and to offer opportunities for people to kind of collaborate and, and you know, ask questions and, um, you know, brainstorm ideas about what's working for them and so on so that, you know, they're able to, you know, kind of move forward. I, I think that education is the key. And I think like when you give a patient medication, they, they should at least understand what the medication hopes to accomplish. You know, they, they have to become not a um, dispassionate uh, patient, but one that is passionate about taking care of themselves and not so dependent on us as doctors to fix it because the bottom line is they're responsible for their own mental health as well as their physical health. And we, we have to give them hope and ownership 
uh, of that responsibility. You know, I think that's I, I think that's really so well said because we live in a society that says when I get sick, I go to the doctor, and the doctor gives me a pill or a potion, and and then you know that's all I have to do. You know, is take this pill. What we do really creates an alliance with the patient, like you said, that therapeutic alliance, which puts a lot of responsibility on them. You know, I can give you 100% of me, but you have to give 100% too. And, you know, changing your lifestyle, changing the way you think, changing your diet. I mean, all of these things are hard work. And, you know, you really need an engaged person to, to actually make this work for the long haul. You know, and Absolutely. Aiden, for example, yeah. Aiden was a superstar with this. I mean, and it's not easy for somebody, especially when they're not feeling good or they're depressed, to actually be willing to make those changes. And he was just, you know what it was? it made sense to him. Like it made sense to him. And he said, wow, this could be it for me. And he jumped in and he never looked back. And I think that's the reason why he got better and why he's on this path is because he bought in from day one and he was committed to getting better. And I think that's such a big piece. And we have to explain that to people that, you know, listen, I can only, I can help you, but you need to help yourself. I think that's a hundred percent because you know, Aiden, you know what, I feel like not just Aiden, I think there's a whole lot of kids that just don't have the tools, right? Um, Aiden was so tired of feeling the way that he did. Every day was just so hard. You know, a day that I would think was just simple. You get up, you go to school, you don't really have to do anything. You come home, you play video games. I would love that. <laughs> it was so hard for him. Um, but once he got the tools, I was like, okay, I, I can do this. And let me tell you, it, it was not easy. It's just not like, oh, I'm just going to eat different. It was a huge commitment, but the rewards were amazing. So I think a lot of this is a lot of these parents, not just the kids don't know what other tools are out there. Mm -hmm. So I hope that even just my story would just give some insight on like, again, there is hope. There's always hope. You just have to, you know, you have to look for it, you have to find it, and then you have to grab it and run. Um, but yeah, it's just amazing. And like I said, I had no idea how closely food and all this stuff is related. I just had no idea. So I hope that, you know, with us talking, people start digging a little bit. It, you know, the information's out there, you just got to find it. So I hope that we can be a landing spot for somebody. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks so much. I'm very much uh, looking forward to, you know, us getting on this, uh, you know, on this Facebook group and helping people. Me too. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.